Eight months into the pandemic, we understand that people are tired and yearn to get on with their lives. We understand that countries want to get their societies and economies going again. That's what WHO wants to. Stay at home orders and other restrictions are something that some countries felt they needed to do to take pressure off their health systems. But they have taken a heavy toll on livelihoods, economies, and mental health. WHO fully supports efforts to reopen economies and societies. We want to see children returning to school and people returning to the workplace. But we want to see it done safely. At the same time, no country can just pretend the pandemic is over. The reality is that this coronavirus spreads easily. It can be fatal to people of all ages, and most people remain susceptible. If countries are serious about opening up, they must be serious about suppressing transmission and saving lives. This may seem like an impossible balance, but it's not. It can be done, and it has been done, but it can only be done if countries are in control of transmission. The more control countries have over the virus, the more they can open up. Opening up without having control is a recipe for disaster. It's not one size fits all. It's not all or nothing. We believe there are four essential things that all countries, communities, and individuals must focus on to take control. First, prevent amplifying events. COVID-19 spreads very efficiently among clusters of people. In many countries, we have seen explosive outbreaks linked to gatherings of people at stadiums, nightclubs, places of worship, and in other crowds. Preventing these amplifying events is essential, but there are ways to hold gatherings safely in some places. Decisions about how and when to allow gatherings of people must be taken with a risk-based approach in the local context. Countries or communities experiencing significant community transmission may need to postpone events for a short time to reduce transmission. On the other hand, countries or communities with sporadic cases or small clusters can find creative ways to hold events while minimizing risk. Second, reduce deaths by protecting vulnerable groups, including older people, those with underlying conditions, and essential workers. Countries that do this well may be able to cope with low levels of transmission as they open up. By protecting those who are most at risk, countries can save lives, prevent people becoming severely ill, and take the pressure off their health systems. Third, individuals must play their part by taking the measures we know work to protect themselves and others. Stay at least one meter away from others. Clean your hands regularly. Practice respiratory etiquette and wear a mask. Avoid the stresses, closed spaces, crowded places, and close contact settings. And fourth, governments must take tailored actions to find, isolate, test, and care for cases, and trace and quarantine contacts. Widespread stay-at-home orders can be avoided if countries take temporary and geographically targeted interventions. To support countries in their efforts to open up, WHO has a range of evidence-based guidance which can be applied in different transmission scenarios. Recently, 
We have published guidance for hotels and other accommodation and guidance for cargo ships and fishing vessels. This is all part of our commitment to supporting every sector to reopen as safely as possible. Meanwhile, we're continuing to work with our partners through the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX facility to ensure that once a vaccine is available, it's available equitably to all countries. I would like to, think, to thank the European Commission for its announcement today that it's joining the COVAX facility and for its contribution of 400 million euros. As President Sula von der Leyen said, global cooperation is the only way to overcome a global pandemic. I fully agree with Her Excellency the President. Of course, it's not just schools and businesses that have been affected by COVID-19. In all countries, health systems have been put under extreme pressure. And the true impact of the pandemic in terms of increased sickness and death from other diseases remains to be seen. A WHO survey published today from 105 countries shows that 90% of countries have experienced disruption to their health services. Low and middle income countries have been the most affected. The survey shows that up to 70% of services have been disrupted for essential services, including routine immunization, diagnosis and treatment for non-communicable diseases, family planning and contraception, treatment for mental health disorders, and cancer diagnosis and treatment. Many countries have started to implement some of WHO's recommended strategies to mitigate service disruptions, such as triaging patients to identify priorities, shifting to online patient consultations, and changes to prescribing practices. However, only 14% of countries reported removing user fees, which WHO recommends to offset potential financial difficulties for patients. WHO will continue to work with countries to provide tools to maintain essential services, 